I'm going to stand here because I'm British and kind of short, okay? So then I can see you a bit better. Can you hear me okay? Um, well, it's delightful to be here. When um, Joe Robinson first floated this idea of, I thought we'd be getting together in a small room with about 20 people having a very informal chat, but it seems uh, young people's mental health has uh, got a profile here and there's a, a lot of interest, which is, which is great to see. And I'm... Uh, doubly happy to be here because when I left the UK this on Monday morning, there was about that much snow in my garden, deep, so it was so pleasurable to be in the sun. <laughs> okay, I know we've got a packed agenda, so I'm going to kind of crack on. Yeah. Um, can I just see who's in the audience a bit so I know who I'm talking to? So could you put your hand up if you are kind of you would describe yourself as a kind of academic or a researcher, type, practitioner, student. Any other categories? Youth workers. Youth workers? Cool, great. Okay, that's nice, nice to know. So I'm kind of pitching this, as I said to Joe, in a kind of demi-academic um, style, and I'm sure if you've got questions about stuff, you can, you can ask me um, about those. One of the things that Owen didn't say about me is that actually I'm a public health expert. So I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, and it means that what I'm more interested in is um, the social and economic determinants of young people's mental health, and particularly um, inequalities. That doesn't mean I'm not interested in what goes on up here, but I'm kind of interested in what happens out there and, what, and how that gets in up, up here. So what I'm going to present today is some findings from a study called Queer Futures, which specifically looked at LGBTQ youth, um, suicidality, and um, help seeking. And today, I'm going to, for obvious reasons, I'm going to concentrate on the kind of digital aspect of that help seeking. Um, and I'm, I'm not sh quite sure how aware some of you may or may not be, but there are very wide and pronounced inequalities in um, mental health between LGBTQ populations and the um, heterosexual populations. And um, young people are particularly vulnerable within, within that, um, um, particularly around suicide and self-harm. But actually we don't know that much about what LGBTQ youth do when um, they feel distressed and like hurting themselves. So what type of help seeking patterns there are around that. We might, we know a lot more about what um, heterosexual um, young people do. But before I kind of go on to talk about that study a little bit, I wanted to sort of talk and think and ask you to think about a couple of things that I think are really important in terms of young people and digital help seeking young people in the digital world. Because I think it's very important if we are to understand um, how we can promote um, good mental health and prevent poor mental health in young people. We understand the digital world in both the senses of what's happening to young people socially and economically, um, what are the pressures, how does the digital fit in that, and actually why young people might use um, the digital world in terms of their uh, mental, mental health. So what, throughout this, what I've talked about today, I think it's important that we think about, okay, why, why would young people be using um, or going on the internet um, how might the internet affect that? What's their views on that? Because particularly in the, the UK, there's quite a um, polarised and hysteric... I'm not saying this is the case here. I'm sure you will... <laughs> you will uh, you, given the, the, all the title of all the talks, I can see that your, the Australian context is a little bit different. But in the UK, it's quite, they're quite... Um, at a government level and in public discourse, there's this kind of polarised and quite... Um, uh, hysterical debate about young people's use of the internet um, on the one hand and on the other hand this kind of rush to the, the, um, the answer to young people's mental health problems is, is doing something up, producing an app okay and there's not a lot in between there and there's particularly not a step back and a thinking about okay why are we doing this why would this be a good way of doing it? what else is going on and also uh, understanding that young people are not some big um, homogeneous group, okay? There's, there may be different reasons why people are using the internet and different effects, etc., etc. 
So I'm kind of going to just say a little bit about things I think that are kind of major drivers in the context in which young people are using um, the internet and being in a digital world, very briefly. Um, naturally, we know, <laughs> this is why we're here, we live, we live in a digital and globalised world. At time, space, distance collapsed, information, click, click of our hands. Um, but, and this is the context in which, in which we're working, but I, I think this is the point at which we need to think about how are, people, how are young people using, uh, using the digital. And in relation to LGBTQ young people, the digital and the internet has become very important. It's a place um, for them to connect with others like them when they might be quite isolated and a whole manner of other things. So particularly for this group of young people, um, what has happened in terms of the digital world um, is really, really important. The second uh, major social dynamic, I think, which impacts on young people's mental health and indeed their relationship with the, with the digital world is the spread of neoliberalism, if you like, okay? The, um, the reduction within welfare provision, the decimation of the welfare state, if you ever have one, and, um, and the precariousness um, this has, the precariousness this has, effect this has on young people's lives. And Judith Besant um, and colleagues have done a really um, excellent analysis across kind of UK, Europe, Australia, and some other kind of, and some English speaking nations, which really argues that um, this insecurity that young people are experiencing, or this precarity, has largely been precipitated by the evaporation of resources that um, support the transition from um, childhood to adulthood in kind of Western countries. So we're seeing young people being most likely to be unemployed, um, there are less training opportunities, education now is often, particularly in the UK, a burden of debt. There is across uh, the Western uh, world anyway, a kind of broken promise around you know, the idea that you would once have a, have a, get an education that would lead to secure and better employment. Um, that actually the idea of living independently from um, where, wherever you, you know, grew up is more and more becoming a fantasy for young people unless they are, um, have the privilege of, a, of, of some uh, resources. And, and particularly in the UK, the financial kind of safety net that used to be around young people and, and supporting that autonomy and independence has just been um, ripped apart. And this leads, I think, to a level of precariousness that is not always discussed in relation to the digital and effect that that might have on young people's um, um, lives. And of course, what this all ultimately means, and what their analysis suggests is, is that it's young people that are um, facing inc this increasing burden of um, neoliberalism, if you like, and a burden of deprivation and disadvantage and um, inequality in comparison to those that are over um, 35. And obviously this has um, impacts on their mental health and well-being. Okay, sorry. And the third kind of major change I think that's important, particularly to the group that I'm talking about, is what I've called legislation, liberalisation and victimisation. Because, of course, young people now live in a world, for many, live in a world that has changed dramatically in its attitudes to LGBT um, people. Um, there's been some huge legislative select changes. I know you've had your own battles here <laughs> um, across the world, and that's uneven, and it's not everywhere, obviously, and in some places it's not, there's no changes at all. And we certainly, in many countries now, have laws that protect LGBT people and policies that promote our well-being. And this has a kind of liberalising effect, an openness. And in a sense, the digital uh, world accelerates this. It allows young people that maybe don't live in a place where um, they have those more liberal laws um, to be able to connect with those that are like them in other places. And um, in many senses, they are at the vanguard of um, sex a sexual gender plurality and fluidity, which is really facilitated by the digital, converse, digital conversations and pushing at those kind of boundaries about what it means to be normal in terms of sexuality and gender. But along with the kind of legislation, obviously there's not an immediate leap into liberalisation, there certainly isn't that sudden eradication of any dis discrimination. So it's kind of uneven um, and that can create its own um, difficulties. So we're seeing um, younger 
it, young people coming out at a younger age, some evidence is beginning to suggest that uh, those, me those discrepancies between um, heterosexual young people and LGBTQ young people are um, emerging at, at an earlier age too. And of course, um, knowing about uh, LGBT youth me comes with um, an understanding that there are, uh, we don't live in a perfect world, we don't live in an equal world. We, you know, we now know about the levels of um, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia in schools. We know about kind of shocking levels of suicidality in that, um, in that um, youth group. And um, um, I wanted to kind of just share a recent, because data, obviously now, it, it's part, part of the, um, the landscape around LGBT, understanding of LGBT um, mental health. So I just wanted to share with you a, uh, an analysis, which is unusual in the UK because it's longitudinal. Um, and you can see here, the red line is sexual minority youth, the blue line is heterosexual young people, so this, was, um, this is from the Avon Longitudinal Study, and uh, young people were asked their, oh, about their mental health ages 10, 12, 16, 18, and 21. And on the, uh, here, I don't need to tell you what that is, you know what that is. So it's a, measure, a shorthand measure for kind of depression. And you can see at age 10, already, there is a gap between those sexual minority 10-year-olds um, and heterosexual, and as, as they, age, that gap is widening, and then kind of, um, I mean, everyone, all, all young people's mental health deteriorates over this time period, we, we know that, and we see a kind of slight tailing off there, but still higher than that. So I think that what that does is give us very important context in how we're talking about the digital, because in the UK, you know, our attitudes to anyone under the age of 16 is fairly punitive and controlling, and we certainly are very uncomfortable with the idea of um, young people having autonomy or agency, and the, the, hence the kind of hysterical debates there are around the, the digital in that context. Okay, so I wanted to say a bit about that because I can't help myself, I'm a public health um, expert. <laughs> I have to give the wider context, and I think it, it, you know, it is very, very important in terms of understanding why young people are using, uh, particularly this gr uh, group of young people, why they're using the, um, the internet um, for mental health support, and um, because otherwise we won't understand, you know, we'll just do it wrong, won't we? We'll be stabbing in the dark. Do you know what I mean by stabbing in the dark? It's <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say a little bit about this Queer Futures study, which was um, a study looking at suicide, self-harm, and LGBT young people and help-seeking. It was um, funded by the UK Government Health Policy Research, and it was part of a commission call looking for evidence um, on, to support the national suicide prevention strategy. It was the first time that LGBT population groups have been recognised, both in the strategy and then in the accompanying um, commission call for research. So that was um, to be encouraged, and it was a collaboration ac across mainly northern England universities. Um, I put this in because I'm, I wasn't entirely sure how familiar you would be with the kind of risk factors around what, explaining why there are higher rates in LGBT young people and suicide and self-harm. So unsurprisingly, victimisation and uh, discrimination around perceived differences in sexuality and gender, psychiatric morbidity, gender atypicality, identifying uh, early as LGBT, conflict, basically conflict with anyone about um, sexual or gender identity, being un unable to disclose um, that sexual or gender identity, substance abuse, so social isolation. And in terms of help seeking, we know generally, don't we, that young people are more reluctant than um, adults to seek help for their mental health problems. And um, there's kind of, when we, when we first started this study, there was kind of suggestions with my, uh, some work that I'd done and Catherine, wave. Hello, Catherine. Uh, Catherine Johnson, who's now with you, but was with us, <laughs> um, around why, why that might be about the stigma in relation to um, seeking help and preference for um, using LGBT um, organisations for help around suicidality. So this study was two-stage methodology and, as I said before, prioritisation around LGBT youth perspectives. So it was, not, it was a study about why, okay, there were elevated rates, not a study about if. So we, we have, you know, tonnes and tonnes across the world evidence that tells us that of the, of the increased risk 
elevated risk for LGBT youth. So the first stage was um, some online and face-to-face -face interviews. You can see the target population group there. And the second stage, we did two online surveys, one with LGBT young people and one with um, mental health service staff. I'm going to concentrate mainly on the um, LGBT youth kind of survey and the qualitative aspect of the study. Okay, so first of all, we wanted to know, this is from the, um, from the questionnaire, um, who they asked for help when they were feeling suicidal or self-harming. And kind of unsurprisingly, you can see that nearly 50% of the sample, so this was nearly 800 um, LGBTQ young people, um, used a friend, then the internet. So kind of quite similar patterns to um, what we would expect to see in whole population studies around help seeking. Much less, third, using the GP. Disturbingly, a, a fifth didn't ask for help at all of the, of the sample. Similar number, mental health services. And you can see these numbers start to decrease now. Parent and carer, girlfriend, boyfriend, school, school counsellors, teachers. You can see that, that the, there is a diminishing use of those places for, as seek, um, for help seeking. So in the context of understanding why um, LGBT young people might use the internet for feelings around suicidality, you can see there that there's not an obvious place in terms of going to parents, people close to you, or school for, for, that, for, that, for that help. We also wanted to know why um, those young people asked for help. We suspected that um, there, were, there would be a major proportion of them that wouldn't ask for help. And you can see here that a large proportion said they were no longer kelp, uh, coping. I couldn't go on with how I was feeling. I was worried about my mental health, out of control, desperate. I, I would, uh, that's meant to say I knew that what I was feeling was not normal. I couldn't imagine my future. Okay, So suggesting really... Um, people were asking for help at a very late on in the, in the kind of the, it, allowing their distress to escalate. So they were really waiting to a kind of crisis point. And in the qualitative study, we'd already sort of done some analysis that really suggested it like that, that this was the case, that actually young, young LGBT people were waiting. And here this is Lee, who's trans, who said... I suppose the turning point for me is the realisation that I would die if I didn't decide to get better. I decided I didn't want to feel like this for the rest of my life. I wanted to achieve something. So we kind of wanted to understand why, why are um, LGBT youth so hesitant to ask for help and why are they waiting until um, they're in this kind of crisis position. So we asked them why they didn't ask for help. And um, this slide, I think, is quite revealing around the complexity of help seeking in young people and very important for us un to understand the context of what any kind of uh, digital in intervention we, we propose to develop. So you can see here, half the sample said, I didn't want to be seen as attention seeking, which is shocking, right? I didn't want people to worry about me. So I think that's also revealing in the sense of, you know, in the UK anyway, you know, young people are really um, stereotyped as selfish and they just want to get away from their parents or whoever's caring for them. And here we have them quite clearly saying, I didn't want other, others, okay, so thinking about others, to worry about me. I felt ashamed of my self-harm suicidal feelings. I thought my family would be disappointed. I didn't want to be judged third of the population. I thought I wouldn't be taken seriously, a quarter of the sample. I didn't want anyone to know about my sexuality and gender. So quarter of the sample indicating that was a reason they didn't ask for help. So it's quite a complex set, really, isn't it, of reasons why um, LGBT young people might not ask for help, which is not just solely about, you know, being LGBTQ, okay, there's other, other stuff that, we, that I think is very important to understand in terms of help seeking and the type of interventions we might design. And our, our analysis of the, of, the, of, the, of the whole was really that these kind of hesit the hesitancy around seeking help for LGBT young people for suicidal feelings and um, self-harm was really this mul these kind of multi-leveled fear of reactions from adults about their um, LGBT status and the disclosing of that. Um, 
naturally the stigma, well not naturally, but the stigma of mental health diagnosis. It's simply, you know, I think we underestimate for young people how terrifying it is, and those of you who are practitioners will be very familiar with this, or, um, to, feel, to have these emotions, to have these levels of distress when the wide world is telling them that they need to be, they should be looking for the future, they should be out with their friends, they should be, you know, full of the joys of, of their life kind of thing. So we've got LGBT, stigma of uh, mental health, um, and this, I think this is, we underestimate this, that, that their feelings and their emotions wouldn't be taken seriously by adults. And we do stereotype young people, don't we? Especially emotions. You'll grow out of it, it's your hormones, you know, always looking, thinking about, we're concerned about the future rather than, than the present. And yes, those might be heightened emotions and they might be confusing for the young people, that, but we need to do something about them, right? Not dismiss them. And certainly that message in the sample that we had and all the work I've been doing is convey to those young people that adults will really just say, oh, it's, it's, what have you got to worry about? I've got a mortgage, you know, that, that kind of attitude. <laughs> if you're lucky enough to have a great millstone around your neck. Um, and there is also an element of, uh, in this sample, and generally in the work that I've been doing, the research I've been doing, that young people feel like they ought to cope. And that's part of the reason we get to that crisis point, right? The normalization of kind of quite distressing emotions maybe. Um, in order to be mature, I should be in control of my emotions, isn't this, you know, you know so actually, they're fit. So, I mean, for some of young people, they are coping, that's not to diminish that, but, but actually feeling like they should. Um, so those co quite complex interplay of, of factors, um, I think you could see, in some sense, that makes to me, sense to me why it is that young people are going online to um, seek help. And this was Anthony, who was gay and a cis male, and um, I think this is a nice kind of illustration of, of the interplay of these things. I didn't want to do the formal thing, so go to the doctor, because I didn't want to be labelled. I had such a thing, big thing about like, being labelled as gay, I didn't want to be labelled the gay, depressed person. <laughs> you can see his point. Um, so when we um, looked at, for those that had asked for help, we asked them how helpful um, this support or advice or information was. And you can see in this rather unpleasant brown colour that um, LGBT youth groups were the, thought to be the most helpful. So nearly three quarters of those who used them found them helpful. Next, similar, slimmer numbers of the internet. So, you know, actually the internet is something that is helpful and useful. Friend, again, similar amounts. And again, we start to see the helpfulness of these sources of support go down and diminish. Okay? Boyfriend, girlfriend, parents only half the time seen as, as helpful, GP half the time, uh, this is our NHS, mental health services less than half the time as um, helpful. So I think you're kind of seeing through this that, there, that actually the internet for this group of young people um, is seen as actually very helpful in times of distress. Um, and this is Brianna, she's a pansexual cis, cis female. She says, I use the internet to reach out to others, to find community, have friends online, mostly all LGBT who I talk to regularly. They've always been really great if I've been in a bad place and need someone to talk to. Um, none of my friends or family are LGBT, so finding people um, online definitely helped me feel less alone and isolated. And I think the important thing here is that in our sample, Virtually the entire sample use, did use the internet for various um, reasons. Very few didn't use the internet or fa um, when um, they were feeling distress. Um, and most participants understood completely that the internet can be a vicious viper's nest, and it, but it can also be a, a fantastic tool, much like we think, yeah? Um, and actually they were much more sophisticated than in the UK we give credit to in being able to discern what was safe and, and what wasn't unsafe and understood the benefits and the shortcomings of that. And when we ask them about the reasons for using the internet, you can see here that 80% um, of them said distraction, information, connection with friends, finding about, out about my feelings, um, support from people you actually don't know, uh, and kind of other stuff. So actually, different reasons, different times, the age group comes into this. And I've got a few of the comments that we had. Um, so I don't think it harms the internet as much as people think. It saved my life. Um, it can provide gr great distraction, but it can be a platform for loud, hateful people. You know, you can see there that there are that there's there's an understanding of a place of 
that is helpful and is not. So we then all asked young people, okay, what, what would you... Thank you. Doesn't time fly? <laughs> Um, what you are, who you were likely to ask for, um, for help. And you can see here, so this is kind of perspective, um, that although there's, a, there's quite a lot of uncertainty on this table, okay, you know, it wasn't a clear cut thing, but certainly they were most likely to want to have some kind of LGBTQ individual group, some actually expert um, input and from the peers. They were less likely or most unlikely to seek help from the family a general youth group and schools you can see quite quite convincing yeah. so again puts the context of the internet and the digital world for help seeking um, it, it paints that picture quite nicely we saw some group differences in um, in that and I think these again illustrate that you know nothing is um, homogeneous so trans young people were more likely to want to use the internet for help around their kind of distress um, and they were more unlikely to uh, utilise face-to-face support. There was age differences with the older age group, um, less likely to use mobiles, the, the younger ones um, wanting to use mobiles. And again, the older group, 20 to 25, more likely to seek um, face-to-face help in comparison to um, the younger age group. And those that had actually planned or attempted suicide were most unlikely um, to choose a phone call. Phone. So, what does this all mean about why um, we should support uh, LGBT young people's mental health via the digital, by, by digital interventions? And I think there are some very significant um, characteristics of the, of the internet, of online interaction that um, is, we should take note of and think about in any interventions that we're designing. And that is about access, obviously, we know that. Um, it's easy to access, increasingly easy to access the internet. Um, it provides an anonymous, and this is true for all young people, anonymous environment. It gives a level of autonomy to, to young people, yeah? Um, no one has to tell them to do it. No, they don't have to get permission. They don't have to, um, they decide. It gives them element of control. If they're fed up, they can just switch, it, switch the thing off. It's a safe environment for LGBT young people, actually you know, which is not a word we normally associate with the internet and young people and mental health. And it's a place in which, part of the reason why it's safe is it's a place in which, um, in the right environment, there is a lack of judgment, which was one of the things that um, was very difficult for the, our young people in this, in this sample. And I think for LGBT young people, they do need something, as indicated by those, uh, the, the data there, uh, something that is specific to be, um, LGBT and that support online or intervention or whatever. And that is partly around um, an indication that we live in a heteronormative world, so they, they want that recognised. They want to be recognised themselves for who they are, not just for, for their own sexuality and gender, but actually as, as young people. And also an LGBT-specific component of a digital intervention would um, has to provide some... It's a level of connection, really, that they may be not have in their actual face-to-face -face environment where their family may not know, and um, school might be a difficult environment for them. So online, to be able to be to connect as, to someone that is um, fully uh, accepting of their, of their identity is very important. And I think generally online mental health support can facilitate for all young people um, their ability to challenge the stigma of mental health. You know, they, can, they, can, they understand that. They can, given the environment, they can do that. It's an environment in which they can unburden that emotional turmoil, admit to failure, uh, confess feelings of hopelessness and reveal fears. Mm. Fear. So actually, it's an environment in which um, emotions can be taken seriously, and you know, an environment in which it's all right to um, to not be able to to cope because there isn't that kind of face-to-face -face setting. Um, so I think a lot of that probably is similar to to the kinds of work that um, others are, are going to speak to, and I hope that I've given you some kind of um, something to think about a bit in terms of LGBT young people. And I want to just finish, if I've got 30 seconds, yeah, um, <laughs> to talk about a new study which uh, Catherine, wave again, Catherine, I'm testing your listening, is working with me on. Catherine used to be at Brighton University and now is, what's it, RMIT? Yeah. So I feel like, a, <laughs> <laughs> if you guys, is there a song to that? <laughs> 
Um, we're working on a new study, the Queer Futures Stu 2 study, which is uh, funded by the uh, British government via NIHR. It's a three-year study and it's identifying and evaluating mental health early intervention support for LGBT youth. So what that's doing is looking at the places where support is provided and that includes it online, in schools, in youth groups and the cl clinical setting and trying to work out actually what, um, what works and what, what doesn't for this uh, group of young people. So that's quite exciting um, because obviously it means the government are you know, serious about addressing the levels of suicidality and emotional distress in, the, in this group of young people. Okay, done. <laughs>